Okay. All right. Well, greetings to everybody and greetings to everybody on social media. So glad you've joined us today. And uh, hey, we've been uh, uh, studying about Jesus's healing crusades and we've been going through the Bible, you know, through the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke and John and chronicling his uh, healings and miracles. And I, I plan on uh, uh, picking up with that here in a few minutes. We'll just see how it goes. But I just, before I, I, I mean, we've been on Jesus's healing crusades now for the last many, many weeks. I guess, what, a couple of months now, maybe. And, uh, and, and we're going to continue with that and all of that. But it just seemed like, like to start out here today, uh, based on what happened yesterday uh, in Washington, D.C., that, that I just felt impressed of the Spirit of God to say a few things before I move on with, uh, with uh, Jesus' healing crusades. Uh, I don't know if you're aware of it, but yesterday, Jonathan Kahn, have you ever heard of him? And he hosted uh, what was known as The Return in Washington, D.C. And uh, it, it was a time to call the United States to repentance. Did anybody uh, see that on, uh, on YouTube or Facebook or so several of you saw it? If you didn't see it, I'd recommend that you go to YouTube and watch that. I, his message, I don't know, his message lasted, I don't know, about 30 minutes, 40 minutes, whatever. But, uh, you know, God has risen him up as a prophet uh, to the United States. Now, for me to say that somebody's a prophet... You, you, you can chalk it down, they're a prophet, because there's a lot of Looney Tunes out there that call themselves prophets that are not, okay? And almost everybody that I've heard that's called himself a prophet isn't. Uh, most of them are just, just nuts, and they're no prophet to anybody. But there are, there are some prophets of God, and he's one of them. And, uh, you know, he wrote The Harbinger, that book, you know, that came out after 9-11. Remember that? And it was, it was very good. If you haven't read that, I'd recommend you read it. Now, he's come out with another book, uh, Harbinger 2, and I'm looking forward to reading that. I've heard some things that he shared in there just with him, you know, as I've followed him on YouTube. But, you know, if you're not familiar with him, after 9-11, if you're not familiar with Jonathan Kahn, after 9-11, how many remembers what happened on 9-11? 2001, where those planes went into the World Trade Centers, you know, and, and, uh, and, and they're in uh, the Pentagon and so forth, you know, and that one that crashed, I guess, in Pennsylvania. But anyway, after 9-11, God began revealing to Jonathan Kahn uh, uh, that the United States was following the same template of ancient Israel. And harbingers, now you know what a harbinger is, it's like a sign, and harbingers or signs leading to God's judgment began appearing in the United States just like they did all those many thousands of years ago in ancient Israel. And you saw the same sinfulness in ancient Israel that you see here in the United States. So he noticed and God showed him that the template, uh, uh, that you, the United States was following the same template of ancient Israel. And... Uh, and, and, and he's exactly right in, in everything I heard Jonathan Kahn share on this subject. In my opinion, he, he's exactly right. And, uh, you know, it's interesting. In ancient Israel, judgment returned to the place of its inception or its foundation. And that is, of course, what happened on 9-11 uh, there was a strike on New York City. And if you study American history, that's where the United States was founded, actually, was right where those planes hit in New York City. And you need to realize that. And that was one of the harbingers uh, that Jonathan Kahn uh, uh, pointed out many, many years ago. And, uh, but, but after that initial strike, uh, God gave Israel, see, there was a strike on on, on Israel, you know, back many in ancient days, you know, uh, uh, and the grounds where it was, was, was founded and so on. And just like in New York City. But in, so in ancient Israel, judgment returned to the place of its inception or foundation, just like it had in New York City on 9-11. And then it's interesting, God then, after that initial strike, God gave Israel time to repent. Which it did not. Unfortunately, it did not. But rather turned farther away from God. It's interesting here in the United States after 9-11, there's been no repentance, no national repentance. But rather, just like ancient Israel, the United States has turned yet further away 
from God. And, uh, but God gave Israel time to repent and, uh, and it didn't. And the judgment of God eventually came to it and Judah fell into captivity. And it's interesting though, that after that initial strike in, in ancient Israel, God gave Israel time to repent. And God gave Israel 19 years, 19 years to repent, which they didn't repent, but he gave them 19 years. And it's interesting. Uh, now, this, this is not a hard question. 9-11 occurred in what year? 2001. And now we're in 2001. 20. So how many years has that been? 19 years. And you see what's going on in the United States. Now that ought to get everybody's attention. You see how the, the template of ancient Israel fits the template of what's going on here. 19 years. Think of that. And yesterday in Washington, D.C., you saw something, if you, if you watched that on YouTube, if you didn't, you can go watch it. But yesterday we saw a for real prophet of God, similar to what you would have seen in Old Testament days. Jonathan Kahn is a Jew, but he's born again. He's received Jesus as his Savior. You, you, you would have seen an Old Testament prophet, so to speak, just like the, the days of old, yesterday, just yesterday, in Washington, D.C., you saw a prophet of God stand and prophesy to the United States, warning the United States to repent or God's judgment will fall. And just like the Old Testament prophet Jeremiah stood, now remember Jeremiah in the Old Testament, just like the Old Testament prophet Jeremiah stood and prophesied to ancient Judah, that they should repent or God's judgment would fall. And they did not, as I already said, it was judged by God and it was overthrown and all of that. But yesterday, yesterday, listen to me, was a most prophetic and pivotal time for the United States. What happened in Washington, D.C. yesterday, Jonathan Kahn, a prophet sent from God to this nation, was most prophetic and pivotal for the United States. And I tell you what, when he took that clay jar, now I was, I was, I was driving in the car with my wife. We were going somewhere yesterday. We were listening to it on her telephone. If you didn't see it, you ought to go watch it. But when he took that clay jar and he picked that thing up, and he threw that thing down and it crashed and broke into a zillion pieces. I tell you what, this, the, the, the spiritual hair on my neck was standing up. I wanted to pull that car over and get out of my car and get down on my knees and repent. I mean, my goodness, what, what a thing that happened yesterday when he smashed that jar into a gazillion pieces right there in the nation's capital, warning the nation to repent. You know, Jeremiah did that same thing with a clay jar. That's why Jonathan Kahn did it yesterday. He was following the template of what Jeremiah did in ancient Judah. Jeremiah did that with a clay pot in Judah, warning of God's coming judgment upon that nation, showing the nation of Judah that impending judgment would come, a breaking and, destru and destruction of Judah would come if they didn't repent and turn back to God. And so yesterday we saw a modern day version of that pot smashing right before our very eyes. And you mark your calendar. Yesterday was September 26, 2020. You mark your calendar. Because I think that's going to be a pivotal thing here as we move forward. Now ultimately Judah did not repent as I've already said. And the judgment of God fell. And just like that shattered pot, Judah, Judah was broken into many pieces and, and fell into captivity. And just, now listen to me, just as God's judgment fell on Judah, so it will fall on the United States if it does not repent. 
Yesterday, God gave this nation, the United States, when he smashed that jar, God gave this nation its last warning. There will not be another one. That's it. And just what happened to that pot yesterday will happen to this nation if it does not repent. And there's not much time left for this nation. And you can see God in His great mercy doing everything that He knows to do. I'm telling you, I've, told, I've said to this to you for years by the Spirit of God, the judgment of God's pending on this nation. Haven't you heard that many, many times? And I've told you by the Holy Ghost, there's three things. Number one, God has got to be welcomed back into the public square and into the public school. And this holy book has to be put back in the public school. The Ten Commandments need to go back up on the walls of the public school. The second thing, abortion has got to be overthrown. It's got to be overturned. Roe versus Wade has got to go. It's got to be overturned. Abortion cannot be the law of the land of the United States. And thirdly, the third thing is same-sex marriage has got to be turned back. They got to roll that back, those three things. Unless those three things are squared up and fixed in this nation, the judgment of God, just as surely as he broke that pot yesterday, this nation will, will be destroyed by God if, if, if. There's not repentance, but there's still time to repent, but there's not much left. Thus saith the Lord God. Did you hear me? And you can see God in his great mercy because something else happened yesterday in Washington, D.C. is there was a nomination to the Supreme Court of Amy Coney Barrett, who I think will be very uh, helpful in overturning Roe versus Wade. So you can see God in his great mercy doing everything that he can to get this nation to turn and repent. But I tell you what, it's deeper though than just a vote on a Supreme Court. Repentance in this nation has to come from the hearts of the people. And it has to start with the pulpits first, it has to then move to the pews, the people, the parishioners, the people, the Christians. And then you could have revival in the nation and the judgment could be stayed and averted. But if that doesn't happen, you'll see the judgment of God fall. Mark my words. Now, having said that, I want you to go to Jeremiah. I want to read a few verses. We'll go to the 19th chapter. Uh, I'll give uh, our projectionist time to look that up. I didn't give her the scripture ahead of time. So Jeremiah, Jeremiah 19, New Living Translation. And I want to point something else out. It, it's interesting. This just jumped out at me. I didn't hear Jonathan Kahn say it. If he did, I missed it. I don't think he said it. So chalk this one up to my observation. <laughs> Uh, but, you know, he's real good at all these minute little details. You know, he's he's the best I've ever seen at it. You know, when this happened, when that happened, relating the minute details of things, you know. But I, I saw one here that jumped out at me. Uh, how many years? Uh, uh, when did when did when did Jonathan Kahn break that pot? Yesterday. Uh, how many years has it been since that strike on 9-11? 19, right? Jeremiah, uh, he, he, he broke that pot yesterday like Jeremiah. Notice here, uh, we're going to read about the broken pot and it's in Jeremiah what? 19. What chapter? 19. Jeremiah what? 19. Jeremiah what? 19. Boy, that ought to jump right out at you, shouldn't it? I just, I was looking at that last night. It just, it's just about knocked me on the floor. I thought, Wow. Whatever significance that may or may not be, I just thought it was interesting. But let's read in the New Living Translation what happened in ancient Israel, ancient Judah, when Jeremiah broke the pot. Because much of the same, now in the backdrop of this, you need to understand this, many of the same sinful sins and sinfulness of ancient Judah was going on here in the United States. It's very similar. 
Okay, what's going on here, very similar to what was going on there as a background to what Jeremiah did here, okay? You understand that? And uh, they'd been warned to repent, warned to repent, warned to repent. Actually, there were two kingdoms, the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. The northern kingdom, ten tribes, Israel. Southern kingdom, two tribes known as Judah. Uh, Judah had already seen the northern kingdom of Israel already judged by God. And yet the southern kingdom, Judah, they, would, they still wouldn't repent. And they'd been warned and warned and warned by Isaiah and others, and they still wouldn't repent. And Judah, uh, actually Jeremiah was the prophet of Judah's darkest hour when they actually fell into captivity and the judgment of God was consummated on that nation. But before it happened in Jeremiah 19, New Living Translation, let's read several verses. Uh, Verse 1, this is what the Lord said to me. Now this is what Jeremiah was speaking. He said, this is what the Lord said to me, go and buy a clay jar. Then ask some of the leaders of the people and the priests to follow you. Go out through the gate of broken pots to the garbage dump in the valley of Ben Hinnom and give them this message. Say to them, listen to this message from the Lord, you kings of Judah and citizens of Jerusalem. This is what the Lord of heaven's armies, the God of Israel says. I will bring a terrible disaster on this place and the ears of those who hear about it will ring or tingle. For Israel has forsaken me and turned this valley into a place of wickedness. Now you need to realize the United States as a whole has forsaken the Lord. This nation was founded on the word of God and and this nation has by and large forsaken the Lord. For Israel has forsaken me and turned this valley into a place of wickedness. The people burn incense to foreign gods, idols never before acknowledged by this generation, by their ancestors or by the kings of Judah. And watch this. And they have filled this place with the blood of innocent children. Have we seen that in the United States? Abortion. They have filled this place with the blood of innocent children. Verse 5, New Living Translation. They they, uh, have built pagan shrines to Baal, who was a false god. And there they burn their sons as sacrifices to Baal. You imagine taking your little baby, putting it on an altar and burning it. See, we don't do that here in the United States. We put a vacuum in the mother's womb and suck the baby's brain out. That's that's how it's done here. They say, Pastor Terry, that's that's pretty graphic. I need to be graphic. You need to understand how horrible abortion is. See, there they'd put their sons on a, on, it'd be like putting your child on a barbecue pit and your baby on a barbecue pit, turning it on high and shutting the lid on it. Would anybody do that? Oh, but here in the United States, see, we're, we're more civilized than that. We take a vacuum like cleaner into the, and suck the, suck the baby's womb, uh, suck the baby's head out, out, suck the baby's brain out of its head while it's in its mother's womb. And other things. You can see why the judgment of God's pending on this nation. That should not be the law of the land. Abortion shouldn't be the law of the land. No more than same sex marriage should be. They burn their sons as sacrifices to Baal. I have, and God says, I've never commanded such a horrible deed. It never even crossed my mind to command such a thing. So, so beware, for the time is coming. This is Jeremiah speaking to Judah here. He says, beware, for the time is coming, says the Lord, when this garbage dump will no longer be called a Tophaph or the Valley of Ben-Hinnom, but the Valley of Slaughter. For I will upset the careful plans of Judah and Jerusalem. And God's going to upset the the careful plans of the United States if it doesn't repent. And then notice this, I'll allow the people to be slaughtered by invading armies. And I will leave their dead bodies as food for the vultures and wild animals. 
That could never happen in the United States. Well, they didn't think it could happen in Jude either. There are those who say, well, we, our founders had a covenant with Almighty God and God would never judge this nation. But I'm here today to tell you that God had a covenant with Abraham, yet he judged his descendants, Israel and Judah. Are we any different? I like what Billy Graham said many years ago. If God does not judge the United States of America, he's going to have to apologize to Sodom and Gomorrah. Billy Graham said that. He says, verse 8, I will reduce Jerusalem to ruins, making, making it a monument to their stupidity. Think about that. All who pass by will be astonished and will gasp at the destruction they see there. I will see to it that your enemies lay siege to the city until all the food is gone. Then those trapped inside will eat their own sons and daughters and friends. You think about that. I don't want to read over that one too fast. Then those trapped inside will eat their own sons and eat their own sons and daughters and friends because of a lack of food. They will be driven to utter despair. See, this is as Jeremiah broke that clay jar. This, is what, this was the message he had for, his, for Judah as he broke that jar. Sobering, isn't it? See, you see the media ministry is telling people how wonderful things are and always, you know, telling people how to be successful. And that's, that's all they preach 24-7 all the time. You need to realize the prophets of the Old Testament, they had a lot of encouragement and a lot of uplifting, just like I have from this pulpit. But let me tell you, uh, you know, there's also times where God has messages like this. We need to hear them all. Is that right? Then those trapped inside will eat their own sons and daughters. They'll be driven to utter despair. You think about how desperate that can be where you're, where you're, did you, did you get what the Bible just said there? Eating your children? Verse 10, as these men watch you, Jeremiah, smash the jar you brought. And we saw a modern day smashing of a jar just yesterday. Very prophetic for this, for this nation in the United States. Then say to them, smash the jar, say to them, this is what the Lord of heaven, heaven's army says. As this jar lay shattered, so I will shatter the people of Judah and Jerusalem beyond all hope of repair. They will bury the bodies here in Topheth, the garbage dump, until there's no more room for them. Verse 15, this is what the Lord, let's just go to verse 15, second time. This is what the Lord of, uh, of heaven's armies, the God of Israel says, I will bring disaster upon this city and its surrounding towns as I promised because you have stubbornly refused to listen to me. So I want to tell you there is still time for the United States to repent. But yesterday, the United States got its very last warning. And I'm telling you by the Spirit of God, the time is very short. It's about to run out. Now, I want to say it again. If you listen to this pulpit over the years, you hear a lot of upbuilding, encouraging things. But from this pulpit, that's not what you're going to get 24-7 all the time. You're going to get encouragement, you're going to get uplifting, but you're also going to get these other things as the Spirit of God uh, leads. If you're watching on Facebook or YouTube, we lift people up around here. We encourage and uplift, but the Bible also talks about some rebuking and, and, and whatnot. 
I get astounded. I heard one minister say, I heard him say it myself, right here in St. Louis. He said, I only preach the happy Jesus to the people. That's such preachers not sent from the presence of God. How many of you know Jesus was happy a lot, wasn't he? But he also made a whip one time, didn't he? Didn't he? And he overturned the tables of the money changers. He, did, he cleared, cleaned that temple out twice, didn't he? Didn't he? Huh? I kind of think Jesus might make a whip and clear some of the Starbucks out of some churches if he were here today. You want Starbucks, it's up the street. You want the word of God, come here. Now, I'm not against having fellowships and socials. I'm not against that. But, but a lot of people anymore go to church for Starbucks more than they go for the word of God. How many of you know that should not ought to be? So I preach the happy Jesus. I also preach the whip making Jesus. I preach the Jesus that said, come unto, all, come unto me all ye who labor and are heavy laden, I'll give you rest. I also preach the Jesus that called the Pharisees and the scribes snakes and hypocrites. Come on now. In those churches that only preach the happy Jesus, they got three, four, five, six, seven services. People just all over the place can't hardly get them all in there, at least before the COVID came. What are those people going there for? To, I, I don't know. But I tell you what, I tell you what, I tell you what, the Bible talks about people in the last days go and they heap to themselves teachers that'll tickle their ears with what they want to hear. I tell you what, I, I like to hear uplifting messages better than judgmental messages myself. But I tell you what, as I look back in my life, those times where Brother Hagin would come out and he'd just step all over my toes, I tell you what, I didn't like that, but I tell you what, I'm better for it because I didn't get offended, but I let him step on my toes and it made me better. Did you hear me? So let's, uh, let's exhort people, let's lift people up, all right, but let's also tell them the truth. Right? And if rebuking is in, in, uh, in fashion, then, uh, uh, then so be it. I tell you what, I, I saw a man of God, a prophet of God yesterday, as we've been talking about, give a message to this nation that it needs to hear. I'd much rather listen to that than the flowery stuff that you hear all the time from so many. But if you listen to that man yesterday while he had this message of judgment in his mouth, I've told you for years, a true prophet of God will have two things in his mouth. He'll have judgment and blessing. Haven't I told you that for years? Judgment and blessing. Repentance and blessing. Did you hear me? Two things. Be watchful of so-called preachers, prophets, that all they have is gloom and doom in their mouth. Be watchful of preachers or so-called prophets who always have flowery things in their mouths. A real man of God sent from the presence of God, a man or woman of God sent from the presence of God, will have a message of repentance or judgment and also a message of blessing. And if you look yesterday, he had a great message of blessing in there. If the United States would repent, he said much about the blessing of God. And that's God's heart. You need to understand that about God. He doesn't want to judge. It doesn't make his day to judge people. He doesn't, he doesn't want to judge people. God wants people to repent. Do you understand that? And even when he does bring judgment, the motive of that judgment is to get people to repent. And if they won't repent, then ultimately he has to let the judgment come in full. You see, but God is a good God. Can you say amen to that? He's a good God. He, don't, don't get a picture of God that he's up there you know, with a stick wanting to just beat people. No, he, he loves people. That's why he sent Jesus to the cross, to save the world, not to condemn it. You understand that? So, so I heard a great message of encouragement yesterday, but there's got to be repentance. 
And so that's what I've always endeavored to do is being led by the spirit of God from this pulpit is have a message of, of both those things in my mouth, a message of, 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 of you know, uh, a blessing, also a message of, of, of repentance, both of those things. I've learned over the years that you have that message of repentance in your mouth and most people are Christians in this hour aren't going to tolerate it. They'll leave and they'll go to a church. They'll find them a church that where they're telling them preachers, tell them what they want to hear. You see something, isn't it? I said, it's something, isn't it? So I, I just didn't see how I could uh, let yesterday go by without uh, saying what I had to say here today. And I hope maybe that jar breaking, if you didn't really understand what that was all about, now maybe you have a better understanding of it. What do you say? So let us continue to pray for this nation. I like what, what he said yesterday, Jonathan Kahn, he said that let revival begin with us. You know, we always talk about praying for revival elsewhere. I like what he said. Revival has to begin with us, each of us individually. And, uh, and so I think we all ought to take a good, long, hard look at ourselves. Myself included, everyone in here on social media that's watching. We need to take a good, long, hard look at ourselves. And, and uh, if we need to make some adjustments in our life, let's make some adjustments. I, I like what Jonathan Kahn said, has been saying. He said, if there's something in your life that should not be there, now's the time to get it out. And repent of it and ask God to forgive you. If there's something that ought to be in your life that's not in your life, now's the time to get it in there, you know. Did you hear me? He's been saying that all along. God is very gracious. He gives people time and space to repent. And uh, 19 years is a pretty healthy long time, don't you think? You see it in the book of Revelation where he gave that lady... That pastor's wife who was teaching false doctrine, he gave her time to repent, space to repent. Now, I don't know how long a space he gave her to repent, but he gave her time to repent. God gives time. But eventually that time runs out. And then he has no other choice but to judge. The Bible says, behold, the goodness and the severity of God. And God offers his goodness. The book of Romans says that he offers his goodness. And he puts his severity behind his back. And he offers that goodness. But if people keep knocking that goodness away and knocking that goodness away and year after year and decade after decade, just knocking that goodness away, eventually you can knock God's goodness away one time too many. And what's left? The, the severity or the judgment. So God is a good God. Let's don't forget that. And his, 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 heart's, his heartbeat is to help people and love people. I can only imagine what this nation would be like if the pulpits again were filled and were aflame with the preaching of righteousness. Just think about that for a moment. If the pulpits throughout the land were again filled with the preaching of righteousness. Remember, Alexis de Tocqueville came over here, I think from, from France, I think it was, to seek out back many, many generations ago to seek out the greatness of America. And he couldn't find it anywhere until he went into the local church and he saw the pulpits ablaze with the preaching of righteousness. What would this nation be like if the pulpits were all ablaze with the preaching of righteousness. Messages of uplifting and encouragement along with messages that refine us and step on our toes to get us to get back in line with the word of God. What would this nation be like? What would this nation be like if Christians lost that apathy that sits upon them? And they became energetic 
and enthused about God. And they couldn't wait to get to church on Sunday morning. And they were just thrilled and ablaze with the exuberance that comes from the new birth. And, 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 and they were just filled with the Holy Ghost and filled with the Spirit of God and filled with love and filled with joy and filled with peace. I'm talking about Christians filled with, with the, good, the goodness of God and, 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 and love and, and, and good things were coming out of their mouths instead of crabbing and complaining and talking bad about this one and that one and the other. Could you imagine a nation that, that had Christians pulpits aflame with the preaching of righteousness and, and Christians uh, full of the love of God and there was no backbiting and there was no talking bad about folks and there was n- 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 no lying and there was none of that. Wouldn't that be wonderful? And people just hanging on every word that came across the pulpits. Wouldn't that be something? Wouldn't that be? Wouldn't that be something? Wouldn't that be something? Wouldn't that be something if? Wouldn't that be something if? If 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 God was welcomed back, if God was welcomed, the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost was welcomed back into the public square. Would that be something? Can you imagine a nation like that? And God is welcomed back into the public square. And, and God is welcomed back into the public school. And the name of Jesus is welcomed in the public school. And this holy Bible, this holy Bible here was welcomed back into the public school. And it was again used to teach the little children how to read. Wouldn't that be something? And the Ten Commandments were again posted on the schools, the walls of the classrooms of the public schools. And that there was a time of prayer to start school and a time of prayer at the end of the day. And and the prayer was in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Wouldn't that, can you imagine a nation like that? And in the process of time, You'd see the school shootings stop. You'd see all the violence stop. You'd see people shooting one another up. That would all stop in the process of time. Can you imagine a nation like that? You wouldn't need police officers at the schools anymore. You wouldn't, you wouldn't have to put, put uh, 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 Geiger counter detectors on the, on the doors of, of schools and churches because they're not getting shot up anymore? Wouldn't that be something? Wouldn't that be something? Wouldn't that be something if, 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 if abortion was outlawed in this land and, and, and there was no more baby killing in this nation? Wouldn't that, be, wouldn't that be something? And all the blood of the innocents would stop flowing? The blood of the innocent children would stop flowing? All the abortion clinics, all that would be shut down? Wouldn't that be something? Would that be something? Would that be something? Would it, would it, be, would it be something if, 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 if everybody straightened up sexually? Huh? And a man was a man and a woman was a woman, a boy was a boy and a girl was a girl? Would that, wouldn't that be something again? You only have to have two bathrooms again? Wouldn't that be something? Would that be, would that be something? Wouldn't that, wouldn't that be something? And marriage in this land was recognized between a man and a woman as a husband and a wife. Amen. Wouldn't it be something if would it be something if the politicians had stopped lying and cheating and stealing? Huh? Wouldn't that be something? I'm talking about Republicans and Democrats. Wouldn't that, wouldn't that be something? Wouldn't that be something if the news went back to reporting the news? Again, instead of just giving you their political twist on everything? Wouldn't it be something if you could go to Fox, CNN, MSNBC, ABC and get the same story because they were all telling the truth? Because remember, if you're telling the truth, there's only one version of the story that's going to come out. Would that be something if news became news again? There wasn't, 
I, I mean, I can, can you imagine a nation like that? Where the news was the news. That'd be wonderful, wouldn't it? That'd be wonderful. Well, I long for such a nation. And all those things are possible. A nation wherein righteousness dwells. And that's, that is possible for this nation. But it's going to take a, a 180-degree turn to go back from where we're going to the Lord. Did you hear me? Yes. Well, it'd be something, wouldn't it? Would it be something? It'd be something if we could see that in this nation, but it'd be something. Well, Just waiting on the Lord to see if there's anything else he wanted me to say. Well, let's, uh, let's let revival begin with us. What do you say? Well, if you're out there and you're watching on social media and you don't know Jesus as your Savior, the Bible says whoever, call, whoever will call on the name of the Lord will be saved. So call on Jesus. Repent and call on Jesus. He'll save you. You'll miss hell, you'll make heaven. And he'll make your life worth living in the meantime. Let's pray. Father, I pray for the United States. I pray for the pulpits of this nation, that they'd be again ablaze with the preaching of righteousness, that fire jump out from the pulpit onto the pew, and that people, the people of God, Christians, would again be, 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 be uh, ablaze with the fire of God on the inside of them, and the apathy would be burned, that fire would burn that apathy off of Christians. And, uh, and we'd be a mighty marching force, an army of the Lord. And, and as a result, we'd go out and tell people about Jesus. We'd be an example before them. And the nation could turn and there could be revival. So, Father, I realize the time is short, but I know you're a gracious God. I appeal to your, your graciousness and your, your slow, slowness to anger. And I ask that you just continue to give us time to repent. I know that if we won't, your judgment will eventually fall. But I just, I just throw, my, I, I throw, as a, I, I throw myself on behalf of this nation on your mercy. And I ask that you'd continue to give us time to get it right, time to repent, sir. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, well, you turn that off now.